introduction. Please give a very warm welcome to Bill Carter. This is obviously the cover of the book. And that's the quote from Emerson that the title of the book comes from. Is the idea is that uh, photography, the philosophy behind the book really is that photography takes you outwards to the world, but it also takes you inward to yourself at the same time, and it becomes a, a process. And that's the, kind of the subtext or the theme of the book. Uh, the book is an outward journey and an inward journey at the same time. And um, people always ask, uh, how long did it take you to do this book? And if I tell them 53 years, they look at me funny. <laughs> but actually, I, my, I was living in Berkeley, um, secretly trying to write the great American novel uh, and getting nowhere. And my mother arrived from Japan and gave me a beautiful camera as a gift. And that started me down this dark, dark and light road on <laughs> photography. <laughs> um, I, uh, I put a, took some pictures of kids on a schoolyard when I was trying to learn how to do the camera. And um, I, then I put the proofs up on the bulletin board and some of the parents wanted to buy some. So then I had to learn to print and then I went to a dark room in San Francisco and it was, uh, and I, one thing led to another. Uh, that's actually the original of the cover picture. Actually, that's a, a, a girl in, in Staten Island in New York who was visiting with her parents and so forth. And I just, I, I love that look in her eye. And I want to say some more about children's eyes in a minute. So that's the first picture I took with my mother's camera in 1958, set, which proves this book took me 53 years. <laughs> Uh, then I began getting more serious about when people wanted to buy these pictures and I started printing them. They asked me to come to their house and photograph their children and their family and that was great. The only problem was when the mother would suddenly run up and try to fix the little girl's hair and, then the girl, you know, and I had to wait another few minutes before the girl calmed down and I would <laughs> proceed. That's an example of, of the pictures I did in those days. All, all these pictures, by the way, are in the book. It's the four-poster four bed. And um, children became a real theme of mine. Of course, I've gone on to many, many other subjects in all these years. But throughout, that would be the consistent theme of, of my work. And you'll see as we go along different parts of the world, these, these kids keep uh, reappearing. Uh, there's one point about this one that I want to bring out. The, the white light in his left eye that's a technical term, maybe you've heard of it, called catch light. And uh, people's eyes many times will have a little reflection in it. And that's some, some photographers look for that and talk about it. And it gives a real focus. And it, um, it's, in a technical way, it's part of the grayscale. You have between black and white, and you have gray in between, and the, the strongest Normally, the strongest tones in a photo are the whites and the blacks in that order. The first one was uh, my step-grandson, Austin, and this is my, his sister, and his, my step-granddaughter, Ceylon, not his sister. And um, so I think the, the double catch lights there tells its story. And that's Ceylon's brother, his name is Joby. That's Joby when he was first born. I think it was the day after. Uh, this is a cesarean birth at uh, Lucille Packard's Children's Ho Hospital at Stanford. Um, they asked me to do a series of births and particularly premature babies. They have a wonderful department there where uh, people volunteer to come in and just hold the babies. And they, they, there's a long waiting list to just do that. And uh, I was very inspired by, by working around there. and. Uh, I even had to look like a surgeon with green uh, scrubs and all that. Um, but I want to talk for a minute about this because um, light is really what we deal with as photographers. Number one, it has a spiritual component, which is in the Bible and many other texts. 
but we, it's also our paint. That's, as artists, that's what we deal with. And this picture, the light, this isn't, uh, I did not use the flash. I rarely use flash unless really necessary, but with a surgical light is very convenient sometimes because it's focusing right on the point. Um, but it's not only that, but it's, you have, you have the light right on the, on the foot and the hands of the surgeon, also on the surgeon's glasses, and also on his hand down below. So, and the rest is subdued. And that's, and when you work very fast and a scene's moving very fast, a photographer has to train yourself to see these things instantly. And I, I spent years actually, if I'd have coffee with somebody, I would move my, even if I wasn't taking pictures, I got to instinctively move my seat so the light would be on their face the right way. It's that kind of thing. <laughs> it becomes an obsession. <laughs> uh, Here's, here's one of the premature babies. Um, many survive and some don't. You just don't know. They come, that depends how many weeks and so forth. That's the top of a baby's head who had an unusual amount of hair at that stage. It sort of reminds me of views of the earth from outer space. <laughs> uh, this is Louis Armstrong at Cornell University. And again, the light was so perfect on that stage at that moment. I had met Louis, talked to him in his dressing room. He's one of my all-time heroes, um, and I'm not alone in that. I was just sad that time didn't make him the man of the, year, of the century, but anyway, that was too exaggerated a hope. But he was such a wonderful, warm, outgoing guy, and you know he was on the road many weeks a year, and he wasn't feeling good, and he just he gave everything. And um, anyhow, Again, about the light, the spotlight on the, that was there and Louis was there and it was a sort of a daring composition with all that black in the middle, but it worked with a little help from my d dark room. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I've been persuaded to blog in the last two or three months. I really hardly even know what it means, but I do have <laughs> blogs up. And I have a, obviously, I have a friend who's helping me. I can write an essay, and he can put it on the blog. I, I, I have one about the relationship between jazz and photography, both modern arts, both very much of the moment. And they have a lot of things. That the, the intensity of the moment is a key thing for both jazz and photography. So. Since I do both, one professionally, one non-professionally, that's something I've been very aware of. So, uh, I moved to New York from Berkeley, having gotten warm, having put that novel on a, a very permanent shelf on hold. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll read you my, my text from my book about, about uh, what happened in New York. By late 1961, I had learned a lot about cameras, dark rooms, and life in the Bay Area on the cusp of several social revolutions. It was time to move on. I went to New York and found a job as a junior editor at a major book publisher. In the rich ethnicity of the Lower East Side, I found a great cheap walk-up floor-through th floor th floor apartment with a side room I converted into a dark room by running hoses through a bathroom wall and down a hallway. Um, well, incidentally, um, <clears throat> this is not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> I was working in the dark room and the phone rang out in the kitchen and I went out to, and it turned out to be a long phone call and I forgot that the wa washer was running in there and it overflowed and it dripped down on the lady below me who had two Steinway grand pianos. <laughs> and she was a teacher of piano at Manhattan School of Music. Um, it was not an auspicious meeting. It actually worked out fine given enough time, but I, I won't go into that. <clears throat> I roamed Manhattan with two Lycas hanging around my neck. The quick paced sidewalks and leisurely parks offered endless possibilities to place my bright light frame 
pictures I still consider my most important body of work from that period. I met people of many stripes, including one that I had long idolized, Louis Armstrong, whom I photographed on and off stage at a concert at Cornell University. I nearly met another idol, the great photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson. My boss knew him and once let slip that Henri was in town staying, staying at the Chelsea Hotel. With trembling fingers, I dialed the number and asked for his room. A kindly voice said, Hello? Hello, is this Mr. Cartier-Bresson? Yes. Suddenly my throat contracted. I was too terrified to speak. All I could do was hang up. It, it was one of those what-if moments that has tortured me ever since. I never did meet Henri, but sometimes we need to let our distant gods remain distant so we can keep growing in our own way. That's my consolation. <laughs> I snagged some assignments around town. Ferran McNally did a picture book on ice skating and another one on horse shows. For my regular employer, Harper and Row, I photographed the Catholic worker, a relief shelter for the homeless on the Bowery, not far from my flat. Often my wanderings took me through Washington Square at the edge of Greenwich Village. There, I never tired of photographing people so engrossed in playing chess that they didn't seem to notice me. By the way, disappearing in a crowd is a great art for a photographer. Um, and I can't tell you how it's done, but, uh, <laughs> but trial and error, and by smiling and making friends when you're suddenly discovered. <laughs> Only later would I learn that Another distant god, photographer Andre Kertes, was living in an upper floor apartment of a tall building at the foot of Fifth Avenue, Washington Square, right above my head. At exhibitions, I pored over prints studying how photography's elder statesmen composed in blacks, whites, and grays to express, express their personal vision. A classicist at heart, I was indifferent to current rages. At museums, I felt lucky to spend an hour staring at one picture and then leave exhausted. On the Lower East Side, I'd come a long way from the emotionally restrained velveteen surrounds of upper middle class LA. When my dressed up Ohio born mother came to visit my apartment on teeming East 6th Street, I wondered what she thought of the newspapers blowing along broken curbs past old men in suspenders sitting on stoops in front of tenements crowded with blacks and Puerto Ricans on the verge of a brawl. Did she have second thoughts about having bought me that ca first camera? <laughs> She never said, and I never asked. <laughs> Here's a, another of my, I call this series Chess Men. Uh, I, my, the shoe is my favorite part of this one. It's a, uh, I, uh, let, oh, in the dark room, I, I did some work on the on the machines, I'm not sure it shows up yet here very well, to gray them down so that they wouldn't take over the picture. Here's a guy residing not far from my flat. Um, I like, actually I like that cross-like shape in the back. It's white against the black background. I have no idea. always and everywhere in the world of children. This is in Coney Island, and just from a sort of technical way that the white, note how the white hat joins the two of the three background panels. This is the New York Public Library in Midtown. I don't know how many of you have, anyone ever lived in New York? Oh, quite a few, yes. <laughs> Uh, you know, in those days anyway, people would come out of those buildings to take any bit of sun they could get with these reflectors to get a little tan. <laughs> I've never seen that anywhere but New York. Okay, then um, 